Joan's seminar this week is a faculty candidate, uh, Christine McCarthy. Um, she's um, currently at the um, Lamont Doherty Laboratory at Columbia University. She obtained her undergraduate degree um, from the uh, University of Oregon in Eugene, and then she got a master's and uh, doctorate from Brown University, and she's been at Columbia since 2011. She's going to talk to us today about, uh, with a title from Micro to Macro, Microstructure Rheology and the Timescales of Heat Generation on IC Satellites. So please welcome Christine McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to, to chat with you today. So today I'm going to take you on a little bit of a, a little adventure to the very small things and the very large things that, I, that excite me. So um, we're going to talk about microstructures and we're going to talk about icy satellites. And so your question might be, um, in those microstructures preview, there's going to be an ice. Uh, so why, why ice and why icy satellites? Uh, for me, it started all, all the way back. Um, the summer between my junior and senior year and undergraduate, I applied for a NASA undergraduate research um, fellowship. I wanted to do volcanoes on IO. I didn't get placed into that. Uh, but I got placed into this lab of Steve Kirby, um, who was looking at, at ice and thinking about um, Europa. And um, wanting. they had previously only been looking at ice. And they're going to start venturing into ice and some of the other stuff, some of these um, uh, reddish features on the, on the surface are related to salts and, and various hydrated species, and I'll get more into that in a minute. But, um, but they're basically going to make their first foray into these, these mixtures, and, they, and for my project, it was really just have fun in the lab, just play. Here's a, a shelf full of reagent-grade crystals and, and some distilled water and a low-temperature bath, and Christine, have fun. And so I was making these samples, and the first time that we put these in the, the cryo SEM, and we you know, found the surface, and we zoomed and zoomed and focused, and these amazing hedge mazes, for all I could tell what they were, um, popped out at me. I was, I was hooked. I thought they were beautiful. I wanted to know what they were. No one in the room knew what they were. And, um, and so I spent um, the summer and the next couple of summers um, exploring these structures. And, and, um, and also, they gave me a, a pile of papers on Europa. And I, hadn't, I was at a, a geology, very Earth-focused um, institute for my undergraduate. And, and this was all new to me. And I was very excited about, um, about what we knew about Europa. And so um, since then, I haven't always worked on just these things. Since then, I've also done a little bit in ceramics, a little bit in seismology, uh, a lot on thinking about how seismic waves are damped as they're traveling through the Earth. The last five years or so at Lamont, um, I've been thinking about uh, friction, in particular thinking about how glaciers um, flow and the friction at the base of the glaciers and how those are affected by the tides. Um, but there's something about, about this, the microstructures and the icy satellites. Something just keeps pulling me back. And so when I was thinking about what to chat about, um, I wanted to, to share some of this stuff. So. Earth. Um, so space. We, uh, there have been almost 200 unmanned missions um, since 1958. And this is a neat graphic. I'll zoom out in a second. But this is a neat graphic put out by National Geographic where they've, they've color-coded all the missions. Um, the yellow missions are from NASA. Reddish ones are from um, the Russian Space Agency. We got some other color codes for the European, Chinese, and Indian space agencies. Dark ones are failed missions. Um, here we go. Um, and it was really, uh, so Voyager and then later Pioneer, sorry, the other way around, Pioneer and then later Voyager that really gave us our first glimpses of um, some of these icy moons of the outer solar system. And uh, good old Voyager, it, they are both um, sending out, they're continuing to transmit as they leave our solar system and head into interstellar space. But it was really the Galileo mission that gave us our first really good glimpses of the Galilean moons of, uh, of Jupiter, and in particular of Europa. And then that was followed by Cassini, more recently, that went out to, um, to look at the Saturnian systems and, um, and looked more closely at Enceladus. 
And so those are two that I like to focus on, Europa and Enceladus, and why? Because they're pretty darn exciting. Because unlike what was expected, that you would find just, you know, that's really cold out there. They, they ex we expected that there would just be these cold, dead moons. And then they fly by and they see that they're anything but. These are some dynamic places. So there is, a, first off, some of the observations, there's a, a distinct lack of, of impact craters. That means uh, on all of Europa, on the south pole, at least, of Enceladus. And that means you have to have some sort of a resurfacing event, some kind of tectonics or something like that that's removing those bombardments. Because they definitely got bombarded. But um, it, they have a, some sort of, at least in some point in their past, this means that there was some sort of a tectonic surfacing event. Um, but even further evidence, the, um, that Galileo mission had on board a magnetometer that measured an induced, for Europa, an induced magnetic field, such that you would, it would require a, um, a completely global conductive layer, as you would find with a salty liquid ocean. And on Enceladus, recent paper in the last year, actually, um, there was a careful analysis of, of the, the, the way that the outer surface, the outer shell, was rotating in relative to the rest of the planet. And um, they always thought that the, there was a huge ocean underneath the South Pole, but they realized by that, by the rotation rate, that it, um, it is actually completely decoupled. So you have a completely global liquid water layer under Enceladus. What is more, uh, when uh, there was fortuitous timing when um, Cassini was flying by Enceladus, happened to go through one of these plumes that are emanating from the, the crack fault, fault system that is on the bottom, what they call the tiger stripes. And so we, we got images of and some sampling of plumes, plumes of liquid water at the surface of these planets, these moons, that are approximately 100 K liquid water. Um, so this is pretty exciting. To be able to have global liquid, liquid oceans, tectonics, um, you know, th these kind of strange surface features that look like rafts that have been broken up and then sort of rotating, floating around on maybe not molten, but maybe softer ice. This all requires heat that is far in excess of just radiogenic heating alone. And so, um, these sorts of things, tectonics, liquid oceans, heat, are pretty exciting in planetary science. Because prior to this, um, there's sort of the paradigm for looking for life on other planets uh, has been that you need an energy source, starting from the bottom, sorry, an energy source, access to essential chemities, chemicals, sorry, and liquid water being stable. And so because of that latter um, requirement, there's been this idea of there's a Goldilocks zone. You know, if you're too close, it's too hot for liquid water, too far from the sun, uh, it's, it's too cold. And so there's just this just right region right here. Um, but to find stable liquid water farther out in the solar system creates a new paradigm. And maybe there's this new Goldilocks zone. So we know now that there's liquid water is stable out there. So what of the other questions? What about access to essential chemicals that you would kind of, you would kind of need tectonics and things like that that would be rotating around? En energy source, um, maybe similar to our black smokers that we have on our own ocean floor. So this, this brings about a lot of questions. And the, in these, answering these questions is, is really a, one of the forefront um, missions of NASA um, in the search for um, life outside of our planet. So that brings about, you know, these are just five that came to mind for me, where, where does this heat come from? How thick is the icy outer shell? And what are the dynamics and plumbing systems of surface features? Um, are there any energy sources similar to, you know, this is just a cartoon, but do they have things like this that could be energy sources? And of course, does life exist? If it does, does it have the same origin as ours? Now, I'm not an astrobiologist, so I have no contribution to this question and, and not really the energy source pathway either. But this stuff, how does that shell behave? Where, you know, how do, how do we generate heat from this icy shell? Um, figuring out the dynamics and plumbing systems, that's something I could do, right? I can work on this. This is long, we've, for a long time we've used um, experiments to help determine the rheologic properties of shell. And it, 
in particular, we've used this in earth science to uh, understand the properties of, of the earth with depth. For instance, using friction experiments to define the, the frictional the frictional properties define the brittle strength envelope, and creep experiments will be used to define the ductile part. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what's found on the Earth, but we can also use experiments to think about seismicity um, at depth. And, and this is another thing, thinking about in these crack systems, um, how would you have, how could you generate heat? So I'm going to be talking about this part, tidal dissipation, sort of in the ductile portion, how to create heat, and in the, the brittle portion. And um, I do this with, with experiments. But, uh, you know, but the folks that are thinking about this, about the models that, that look at this whole big picture, um, there, there's a lot of ways that you can think about ice. So yes, there might be, if you're thinking about a time scale, it's instantaneous. Uh, maybe you can think about it as an elastic medium, and that does the trick, and you can stop there. But I think as models become more um, advanced, and we have more considerations, and particularly your time scale is increasing, um, you need to think about it as a polycrystalline, viscoelastic solid, warts and all, by which I mean subject to grain boundary processes, um, trying to understand how the porosity in second phases, whether those are solid or melt, affect things, fabric, and, and, and various forcings. And the kinds of mechanical properties that one could measure in the lab, maybe I'll go over this way, one could measure in the lab are here, and these are ones that could go into someone's models. Um, and that are likely affected by all of this are here. But it would be make for an incredibly long lecture if I actually went into all of those things, so I won't. Um, I'm going to focus on, and also I, I won't because there are people here in the room that are probably more, ex, ex, more knowledgeable about some of these things, for instance, fabrics, than I am. Um, so I'm going to focus on two, two that I've, um, experiments that I've run, attenuation and friction, things that I've measured, um, and in particular um, with frequency, so measuring not a steady state, but how they respond to tidal forcing, periodic, periodic forcing. Um, and I'm going to focus on second phases, um, how that affects the microstructure, both as a solid and as a melt. And why second phases? Um, unlike on the Earth, where the ice is relatively pure, very small amounts of impurities, on these icy moons, the spectral data tells us that there's actually quite a large, port a large or a significant amount of, of other stuff. So for instance, on Europa, here's a little uh, artist's rendering of, of Galileo taking spectral data. Um, and the abundance is here, so red is a high abundance. And there's, there's been identified basically three types of components. And um, so the one type is primarily on the trailing hemisphere, and that's been associated with sulfuric acid. The idea of that is that it's coming from Io, actually, and it's coming onto the surface. Io is the innermost moon of Jupiter, uh, well, inner to, uh, to Europa anyway, and it is, um, has rampant volcanism, constantly spewing out sulfur dioxide from its volcanoes, and that um, Europa is kind of trailing into the, that cloud. Um, also, it's identified, of course, ice, which is found really concentrated on the, the poles. But there's also, um, in the, the, the equatorial regions, there's some sort of a hydrated salt that has been observed as well. So acid, salts, and of course ice. In the case of Cassini, on 2000, in October 2008, we were, as I said, we were fortuitous enough that they was, it was flying th right through a plume. And it was actually, it was able to take a sample, and it has an onboard mass spectrometer, and able to analyze that liquid gas vapor. And um, among other things, lots of things here, uh, ammonia was found. That's the green. So I'll be getting back to why I keep, I'm highlighting sulfuric acid and ammonia. But um, now I'm going to take you a little bit on a, a side venture. Um, so what I was thinking about that very first summer, that I was just looking at icy satellites and having a bunch of reagent grade crystals is, what does that mean for ice? What does having um, some various salts or various acids in 
contact with ice, in solution with ice, how does that affect the microstructure? So um, this is going to be, for some of you in this room, this is going to be very, very um, remedial. But I just really like to show this. Before I just start flashing up the, the pictures, I kind of like to show the cartoons and the theory that goes with it. So, um, so as you know, by throwing salt on the sidewalks during the winter, that various salts and acids will depress the melting temperature um, to this eutectic temperature. Um, but one interesting thing is that ice, the crystal structure of ice is so very different from any of these salts or acids that it does not want any of it inside its crystal structure and vice versa. So there is no solid, little to no solid solution. So, um, you know, I just have here this generic A and B, but we'll, we'll call A al um, alpha, we'll call that ice. But there is no solid solution on the sides. And um, specific phases of the various salts, hydrated um, phases, would appear as vertical lines in a phase diagram. So what does this mean for the microstructure? Well, let's just bear with me. I'm going to show you a little cartoon um, or a little drawing schematic. If you had, for instance, a test tube of liquid solution at this composition um, and you went down below the liquidus, you would have crystallization of whatever phase is in excess. On this, in this case, that would be alpha. And it might be form little dendrites into your liquid. And then as you got below the solidus, your, your liquid, which had been following its composition down to the eutectic, will crystallize into this, um, into this uh, eutectic structure. If you had just eutectic composition, nothing, nothing, nothing would happen, and then you would have in theory, you would have crystallization of this two-phase eutectic stuff. I say in theory because in reality, sometimes you might traverse one of these metastable extensions. So what is that eutectic crystallization all about? Um, that's what my, my question was when I was first looking at these things. What is that all about? How is that form? Um, and it's really all about uh, a system experiencing a gradient, in this case temperature, and is trying to minimize its energy. And so there's this, um, this is very, I realize, a very simplified version, but here's a, a study that I found that is describing this in terms of the two solid phases. Again, they, there's no solution, solid solutions, so they want to be pure. And they're growing into a liquid of a, a eutectic solution eutectic composition. So you have in this little layer at the solidification front, you have diffusion of A away from, of B, from B and vice versa um, into, into the, you're making these nice lamellae. And the, the scaling, this lamellar scaling, is controlled by the velocity, how fast I can proceed, which is in turn controlled by diffusion, energy between the phases, the eutectic, and uh, this enthalpy of fusion. Um, and so I was looking, this, was a, this theory was originally made for metallics and ceramics. And so my question was, well, can I use this to describe my ices and salts? And, and so for instance, this picture that I showed you in the very beginning, this is a magnesium sulfate hydrate uh, with ice. So the ice sublimates faster in the SEM, so it's in relief here. I'm sorry, it's, it's recessed here. And then the, the hydrate is standing out, and it's the whiter phase. And, um, and you can see these microstructures that I'm seeing are, are nearly identical to what you see in the, the, metal, the metallurgy, metallurgy literature. Um, and so I, it turns out that you can predict the morphology of eutectic structures based on something called the um, entropy of fusion of individual phases that you determine from the entropy of fusion of individual phases growing into the liquid. And I compared this to the various salts and um, I found there was really good agreement from the morphology of the structures. And, and I know this is a very simplified version, but um, uh, I just found that was fascinating that the, the same physics that controls solidification of metals controls salt and, and ice crystallization. And of course, the same theory is what, um, what makes freeze casting work, this kind of solidification. Um, I was, of course, thinking about what would naturally form on icy satellites, maybe in crack systems, or somewhere where you would have a, a, a melting, refreezing event, event. But you can actually um, manipulate and manipulate this process to, um, to your advantage to make um, intricate microstructures, as, as uh, people here are, are well aware. Um, and so now let's return back to nature. 
Now, um, probably, except for individual cracks and things, probably you don't have eutectic composition. Um, so maybe you have more dilute, um, a, a more dilute composition. And indeed, the spectra say that probably uh, about a three weight percent of the impurities is about, is about all you would have. So thinking back over here, now what is the microstructure for um, ice plus some sort of a liquid? And that is, is something like this, where you'd have the liquid is in the triple junctions. And you can actually, um, it, the, the geometry of this is controlled uh, by the, the relative surface energies in this dihedral angle. And that dihedral angle will give you an indication of whether the melt is trapped or it's fully mobile and able to move around. And, um, and this is all important because whenever you have a partial molten system, it's, the melt can very much affect um, the physical properties. And so I kept kind of, uh, even though there are lots of possible second phases, the two that I was really kind of glomming onto were that sulfuric acid and the ammonia because they both have a really deep eutectic. Um, so here about 60 degrees, almost 100 degrees. So that means in some icy shell, there is a big portion of that that could have a partial melt. And like I said, it's been studied that in many different systems, here's olivine plus basalt, um, and many systems with very comparable dihedral angles, um, they are, are known to very much be affected by um, having the presence of partial melt, even, even to very small amounts. And the idea behind that is that for any kind of a grain boundary process, having melt there creates kind of this super highway. So if you've got a diffusive process on the grain boundaries, it will move much faster when you have um, a small amount of melt. But the question might be then, is, uh, is there a critical limit to that? What is the, the, the lower end of that? Is there a critical melt fraction? And actually a really nice paper um, that just came out this year out of these labs shows that if there is, it is incredibly small. And this, um, the work by Hammonds and Baker, they looked at just PPM doped ice just 1 to 15 ppm doped with sulfuric acid. And um, they didn't see necessarily the orders of magnitude softening that you get um, with some of these structures. Uh, but they still saw across the board a, a weakening when you have uh, the, the doped samples of sulfuric acid. They also looked, um, they had really nice Raman spectroscopy that was able to identify, this is the, sort of the, the acid peak, and they were able to identify that the melt, even at those low concentrations, was found at triple junctions and along grain boundaries. And so this was looking primarily at viscosity, um, and, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. I wanted to talk to you about the experiments that I did looking at uh, another time scale of deformation. So uh, a material responds to uh, a, a stress in, it, <laughs> it, uh, in response to a, the timing of the forcing. So um, at instantaneously, you would have an elastic response. Um, over very long, quasi-static time frames, you would have this viscous response. But in the middle, you have an anelastic response. And that's where I've spent most of my career kind of delving in. That's the frequencies of seismic waves, for instance, or of tidal deformation. So the next few slides, I'm going to be telling you about experiments that I've been participated in um, that measure attenuation, so, um, which is the anelastic response. And so in this case, just like if you took, if you took a, I like to give this kind of analogy, where if you took a, coat, a metal coat hanger and you went back and forth, back and forth, and you felt the junction, you would feel heat. And that's because microstructural elements are moving back and forth and, and generating heat. In the same way, these icy satellites, as they traverse in their elliptical orbits, the, the bulge is moving around in such a way that it's kind of torquing this icy shell. And so the, the magnitude of how much heat can be produced, how the system will turn that mechanical energy into heat, depends on the rheology and the material. So that's what I was measuring. I was applying a sinusoid of stress and measuring the response of the system, which is also a sinusoid. The tangent of the lag between the two is attenuation and the, um, the, the ratio being relaxed modulus. And so before I show you real data, a kind of a cartoon is that um, in, in so many of these experiments from across labs, the general form that you get of your response, you measure 
um, as a function of frequency, chest, making the same measurements at multiple, multiple frequencies, you get this kind of um, this broad, this broadband spectrum, this um, low frequency att attenuation um, uh, that is shifts that shifts with temperature and grain size um, horizontally, and a consensus has emerged that the mechanism for that that spectra, which is called the high temperature background, um, the consensus has emerged that this is due to a process called diffusionally accommodated grain boundary spacing. So the idea with this is that as you, if you've got a sample like this, and regardless of whether you're loading it this way or you're loading it this way, um, that individual grains are going to, the moment you start, they're going to um, just elastically um, feel that. They're going to respond elastically. But then as they start to have to slide past one another, they're going to get locked up. You're going to have stress concentrations that build up that need to be um, relieved. And so you might have mass diffusion or dislocation motion um, along the grain boundaries. Eventually, they will move into positions that they can't get out of, and so you have permanent viscous deformation. But over here is your analastic your response, your um, time-dependent but fully recoverable response, where you might have just mass diffusion along your grain boundaries, moving back and forth. So I, I should do it this way, back and forth, back and forth. So now showing several studies of data. So the black in the background is some is some work that I found uh, that I did, and um, these are multiple studies on olivine dominated samples. Oh, no. And one interesting that, thing that we found from our study was that um, if we if we looked at the raw data for all of these, they would just be all over the place because um, olivine is very different from the um, uh, borneol, the organic uh, material I was using for these studies. Um, but we found that if we normalized by the Maxwell frequency, which is the underlax modulus divided by the viscosity, that it had the effect of, 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 all, of the, all of the curves collapsing on one, on one another, creating what we call this master curve. And, and this can describe that, that grain boundary diffusion. The fact that they all plot means that the same mechanism is acting in all of those cases. But now, I told you I was going to be talking about the effect of melt. So we, it's well known the effect of melt on elastic properties, but the anelastic response is not as well known. So that's something that we were studying. Um, and, and unfortunately, I, I, they, we have a slightly differing views, and so I'd say the answer is not completely readily available yet. But in some studies, for instance, um, our study on this organic material, but which is comparable to what was done in ice and brine, we see um, just a kind of a, a shifting of the curve with, um, with, with a partial melt being. So you get, see a, a, a jump, a big jump in attenuation with the presence of even a little bit of melt not a lot of difference between um, increasing amounts of melt. So the bottom one is 0.25 weight percent up to four. Um, and that kind of response would be well classified, it would be well described by this sort of thing. So if it's a grain boundary process, having the melt there exasperated that process. But other studies have also indicated a high frequency peak, an, a unique peak. Um, and so I would say that um, really constraining the effect of melt on, on ice and also on, on all partial melt systems is something that I, th I think the word is still out on and we can, we can do better. But what does some of that mean for Europa? So uh, basically, I didn't talk about the Maxwell solid model, but, but a Maxwell solid model is just a, um, it just uses an elastic term and a viscous term and it sort of ignores analasticity. But I just showed you there's, for, at tidal frequencies, there's, there's a, a nice analastic response. So I think models that are trying to describe this whole, this full system of Europa, first of all, need to go a little bit better than using a Maxwell model. We can use some of this experimental data because ice and other materials dissipate um, based on grain boundary processes. Their warts and all are, are, are important. Um, and then also we found that um, uh, higher temperatures are high, uh, create higher attenuation and melt creates higher attenuation still. So this means that you can really um, pump a whole lot of heat into these icy moons that I, I think is really um, answers the question of where does the heat come from. Um, 
And, but also one side note is that um, by the, based on the geometry of the melt for many of these systems, having that dihedral angle that is low, that communicates, uh, may be a way for um, just communication or transport through an icy layer. The timescales I, I don't know about, but, but that's just one indication. But now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. I've talked to you about what's happening in response to the tidal flow, what's happening, the tidal forces, what's happening in the ductile layer. But let's think about now what's happening in the brittle layer. Um, there are many faults, fault systems that have been observed both on Europa and on Enceladus. On Europa, they've got all these interesting faults, as you can see, but one in particular are these cycloids. They think that might happen based on the, the tidal, as the stresses during the tidal cycle, they move around, that they're cracking, kind of happens in response, but how those propagate, what are the fracture um, properties, uh, is, is really not well known. And on the tiger stripes, uh, it's, it's not clear how, where they came from to begin with, but they are being monitored, um, and there's, there's a distinct strike slip component to, um, to the tiger stripes. And so how does that work? Is that, en is that enough to create frictional heating that could create liquid water at the surface? Um, and so that's something that we can explore with friction experiments. So uh, the next part I'm gonna be telling you about a second type of experiment that we're doing right now at Lamont. Um, and so it's with friction, just really simply, you all have already have a real tactile feeling um, for friction um, that it, it depends not only on the, the, the weight your, your normal stress, the weight of the thing you're pushing, but on this resistance. And, and if you think about it being the, the sheer resistance of a little point contacts on your entire surface area, and that when you push something, you're, uh, you're gonna wait until you, it's not going to move until you reach that threshold of static friction, and then you'll get the kinetic friction. Um, but there's been just decades of of work on friction, particularly in rocks thinking about um, earthquakes and earthquake propagation. And it turns out it's also, it's not so simple. It also depends on the velocity that you're pushing. Um, there's a so this is rate state friction has been developed and it depends not only on the velocity that you're pushing, but also it has, it has a memory. It knows how long it's been sitting there. It has a time component as well. So if you are, are pushing and then you stop and then you're pushing again, and say you stop first for one second, and then you stop for 10 seconds, and then you stop for 100 seconds. The, the static friction that you have to overcome actually increases by the log of time. And, um, and we can use, in order to come up with all the parameters that go into this, um, we run experiments, for instance, here, where we, we start at one velocity, and then we Instantaneously, instantaneously switch to another velocity. So here, going slow to fast. And, and we measure this would be friction, so the normal stress, sorry, the shear stress divided by the normal stress. And then we see that the direct effect, as soon as we change the velocity, we see a spike up. And then it evolves to a new steady state value. And that is important, that, that new value that it goes to. With an increase in velocity, does that have a higher friction or a lower friction? So is A minus B a positive number? In that case, um, this has been associated with just sort of smooth sliding. You can't have big earthquake events. But if it's a negative value, um, that, it, that, um, that it gets weaker as you increase the velocity, that's when you, it might be possible to have earthquakes. So what does a stick slip or an earthquake event look like? Um, we do this, this fun thing for when we have kids come in um, for outreach where we just put a big board out and we stick a, a big brick attached by a string to a motor and there's a spring. Spring's very important. Um, and we turn the motor on and of course the, the, at first the brick is just stable. It's just sitting there, it's not moving. The spring elongates and then at some point it lurches forward. And so that if the spring can be considered like the stress of a system, the stress is building, 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 and then you have an event. It lurches forward, and so that's a, an earthquake or a stick slip event. And so in the field of um, earthquake research, uh, this has been used to try to identify um, what are the possible behaviors of, of faults with depth. So um, 
using experiments that vary the temperatures and pressures and looking at the response, that A minus B, um, it's been found that you know, at, shallow at shallow positions, they're very stable. And then as you go to depth in the Earth, you have this unstable behavior where you have this, um, this, this velocity weakening behavior. And this coincides very nicely with the locations of earthquake sources, so where earthquakes generate from. And so, um, so this is, has been a very successful way to use experiments to, um, to describe the, the behavior with depth in the Earth. And so what are, we're trying to do now is do the same thing with these icy satellites. So can we, can we make that, can we fill in that curve for icy satellites? And, um, and so we have developed uh, a friction apparatus, very simply, on a shoestring budget, really, um, to do, uh, it's a biaxial apparatus, push in two directions, so the normal stress, here's a, it's a double direct shear configuration. We push this way to make our normal stress. And then these two side blocks are stationary, and we push down with some known velocity. And, um, and that will measure, um, we know the velocity, we know the normal stress, so the, the load cell up here is giving us the shear stress that the system's feeling, and that is our friction. And you know, this has been done before, there's been great experiments coming out of the labs here to measure friction, um, some other work. So our spin on it, though, was to see, okay, well, you've got these, these faults that are being loaded by the tides. Let's see if we can add a time component to see how they respond. So we don't just, push with a constant velocity, we have an oscillation. So we push with a sinusoidal velocity. So for instance, at a, an average 10 microns per second, we're going 20, zero, 20, zero, and, and seeing the response. And um, this is just experiments we just started, and so we don't have a lot of data, but we, the data we got I thought were very exciting, so I wanted to share it with you. So here are the results. There's a lot going on. Let me walk you through it. So we are comparing two systems, a pure ice system, which is just teal, so I had just ice, ice, ice in my blocks, um, and that's the teal, and then we also made a sample of three-way percent ammonia, so ice plus ammonia, and at these conditions, uh, about minus 50 C, which would be right here in our phase diagram, so the, the ammonia would be found not as a solid, but as a, as a liquid, like little partial melt in the dihedrals, um, we found, um, couple things. So the one thing to note is, you know, I, we're doing a, a, um, an oscillation about, about a median value. So that, this is a, the oscillation. This is the forcing, the velocity. So the median or average values that we got, at first we thought, oh, wow, this is really high friction. And then I, I was able to look at uh, Dr. Schulson's paper and realize, okay, no, this is exactly what they got to, uh, this 0.72 for friction of just a, a pure ice at this velocity, at this temperature, was very consistent. Um, but we saw that when we are pushing it with the sinusoid, it is responding in kind, basically. It's just smoothly sliding in response to that sinusoid, which is very different from the ice plus ammonia sample. At the exact same conditions, the same forcing program, we saw, for one, a reduction of the friction, but not all the way down to 0.1 like you would have if you had a whole melt film. So it's just a reduction, a partial reduction. Like, like it's a, an average of all the different, you know, there's going to be ice contacts and, and melt contacts, and it's some sort of averaging between the two. Um, but also the most striking thing was that we saw very distinct stick slips. Um, at this period, we saw one stick slip event on every cycle, and zooming in on here, the higher frequency, doublets, basically, on every cycle, two, two distinct stick slip events. So uh, we thought this was pretty exciting. Um, yes. So we thought this was pretty exciting, and we can use, in combination with what has already been known about uh, ice, we can use, for instance, um, the Schulson and Forte data to come up with an A minus B, because they saw very distinct um, at, at warm, sorry, at colder temperatures, um, velocity strengthening behavior at intermediate, they saw stick slipping, and then they saw back, back down at cold, at warmer temperatures, they saw um, smooth sliding. Um, and so we'll be able to do this, make this curve for pure ice, but also with our experiments, indicate how this curve would shift if you've got second phases around. And maybe that could tell us 
maybe we'd be able to use the seismic signals, because eventually we're going to be putting seismometers on these places, um, to be able to locate the sources of seismicity. Um, and so also the, the events were timed with the velocity in very sort of non-intuitive ways. Um, so we're going to be trying to explore that to see if there's something about the seismic signal and how it responds that will um, aid in our understanding. And so um, our future direction then is to take some of these, these models that people have come up with for frictional heating on these icy satellites. And um, there's so much room for improvement. At this point, they, they use very simple models that basically just use a single friction parameter for the entire, <laughs> for the entire um, fault system. Uh, over the entire forcing um, system. So I think we'll be able to use, for instance, the observed um, tidal stresses to come up with, um, with a uh, periodic stressing system and then be able to compare pure ice and ammonia to the kind of observations and see if we can get the kind of heat that you would need to, um, to create the, the plumes that they're observing. Because when they do some of these simple models using um, very simple parameters of uh, friction, uh, they're not getting the enough, enough heat to, to make liquid water. And so they've kind of abandoned this idea of frictional heating. And, and well, you're not using the right values. So I'm hoping that we can um, provide better model models for this system. And that the whole goal for that then is to really just inform some of our future missions. So um, in 2025, we're supposed to be launching for a, a NASA's going to be launching a, a kind of lander that um, might have seismometers in the feet that could be used um, to try to understand the, the properties of the shell. Um, in 2032, they're thinking about going one better and, um, and being able to drill through the ice and try to find liquid and try to, to perform some science and, and, um, and get the chemistry um, and try to see if they can find precursors for life. And who knows that, you know, this, doesn't, this isn't on the books, but um, the, the, their ultimate goal, though, is to be able to drill all the way through the ice and then um, send little autonomous robots around in the water. So um, anything that uh, us back at home in the lab can do to help constrain some of the properties, I think, is, is greatly appreciated. And that's the, the goal of what we're doing. So that's, that's all I have for you today. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you.